we do have to so, yeah, that's our thing. Um, and, um, we'll talk to you in a minute. Um, so just a few things, my name is Tanya, um, we've got a... Okay, as Tanya mentioned, my name's Nathan, um, mentioned all the other people. Yeah, we've got Warwick and David um, who are presenting, and also Deb who's helping out. Yes, and Kieran and Tanya. Okay, um, two and a half hours. Um, we're going to start off going um, along the Lapston zigzag. Um, this walk is going to take place on some of the, well, the very first railway that went over the mountains. So there actually were three railways. We're looking at the first railway, um, the Lapston zigzag and the Lapsack Bridge. And there's quite a story to that. Um, we're also going on the side of the very first road over the mountains, the Cox's Road. And um, we're looking at that story too. So this is actually a, um, it's a historical walk, but we're looking at, uh, there's a story about transport over the mountains and, um, and about the mountains themselves. Firstly the zigzag, the first railway, but it's also the side of the first road, Cox's Road, which was built in 1815. And David's going to take over and talk about, talk about this side of it. Okay, so two endpoints. So we have um, the first road crossing. Um, so we know the story about Blackstone, Wentworth and Lawson in 1813, crossing the mountains. So they went straight up the hill here, uh, which is what is now Knapsack Street and into walking into uh, the nation of the Zarek and Gunungurra people. Um, they were followed um, by the surveyor, Evans, um, who plotted a route for the road, much as, uh, as Blackstone, Woodward and Lawson walked, and followed then by um, the road builder, Cox, and a party of 28 people, including convicts, who built a primitive road in six months, that was pretty quick, uh, across the mountains. It was a pretty primitive road. The road here didn't last particularly long. Um, it lasted <clears throat> until 1824. Um, it was um, straight up the hill, as you did in those days. The road just went straight up the hill. So it was steep, uh, subject to wash away, difficult to maintain. So they built the, um, the road that's now known, known as the Old Bathurst Road, which is uh, what's it called, the zigzag road. It has some um, hairpin bin, hair bins in it, which were not very good for bullet trains. Uh, it wasn't very successful, um, and so they built Mitchell's cars. Now Mitchell was a surveyor, uh, and Lennox was the builder of the bridge, the Lennox Bridge. So, um, there it is. Um, so it's another attraction of Benbrook in the local area. We won't share today, but have a look if you want. Um, and that survived up until the 1920s as the <clears throat> as the main highway over the mountains when it was surpassed by um, the road um, coming down this way where it is, more or less where it is now, and rerouted in the 1990s to its current uh, location. So we've had a number of different, or five different roads to get up the mountains, and as we'll see, we've also had a couple of different attempts with the railway as well, three. Um, so we're standing here also on the alignment of the, the top road, as it's called, of the zigzag. So, the railway uh, in 1867 came right where we are. So we've just um, parked that at the moment, but we'll get back to that. But um, what I would like to talk to talk about is just about the railway generally, uh, the origins of the railway here. Um, so starting um, in the 18, early 1800s in England, um, uh, it said that railways were the gift of uh, England to the rest of the world. I'm not quite sure whether it's true, but um, they started in northern England and uh, a number of railways were built there. It was almost a commercial non-brainer. If you build a road, it attracted passengers, it attracted uh, freight, uh, took it off the, the rivers and the canals, uh, and you made a lot of money. They tried to translate that model here to Australia. So the beginning here in Sydney was that private companies, the private companies started building and investing in the railway from Sydney to Parramatta. Uh, but they went bankrupt. The situation here was different than in England. Um, was um, rather um, risky in terms of investment. Um, labour was short with the gold rush and so on. The labour kept disappearing um, and a number of problems, inflation, lack of materials and so on. The government took it over and also a similar venture in Newcastle, which also failed. The government took that over as well about uh, what sort of railways should be built, the standard of the railways, the cost of the railways. The cost was astronomical for a, a young fledgling economy. Um, and um, so 
So the railway that was commenced by the private operators was finished by the government. As I said, it was operating in 1855. It had, I think, four locomotives, um, a few um, wagons and carriages, and 23 miles of track. Now, they looked for somebody then to take over the, the uh, engineering of the railways and expand from that. So they looked in England and they recruited a man called John Whitten. He had uh, already experience of building railways in, in um, northern England and um, he was keen to take on the job. He was well paid. He was in fact the second highest paid or highest paid official in, in the country at the time. Uh, he brought with him the knowledge of this new technology and uh, was able to apply it in, in his service from 1856 up until he retired in 1889, he expanded that 23 miles to 2,100 wow. plus miles, so a hundredfold increase. With all the civil works, the difficult terrain, um, the politicians and leaders that he had to battle and had different ideas about what should be done, and particularly those who wanted horse-drawn um, <laughs> trains, so can you imagine crossing the railways in a horse-drawn train, but anyway. Um, and so his name we'll talk about quite a bit today because he was the engineer um, who supervised the construction area. The mountains were a barrier um, um, and um, nobody was really interested in living in the mountains. Um, it was just an obstacle to get over but once crossed with the zigzag here, the railway up and over the mountains and on to the other side uh, opened up the, the whole of the interior to development. So we might move along a bit and we'll talk a little bit further about that history. Some of you will stop and talk about plants. Just push on then to further expand that railway, just going south and also going west. Uh, so coming west, um, it reached Penrith. <laughs> The railway reached Penrith in 1863, and if you consulted your Bradshaw's guide, I haven't got it with me today, but um, it would tell you that um, the options there were to catch a Cobb and Co coach from Penrith uh, all the way over the Bathurst that ran twice daily. So you can imagine this all in a Cobb and Co coach. Um, so the push was then on to ex extend the railway from there. So it was built, um, the first obstacle, of course, was the Nepean River. So um, we had a bridge. Time. It's quite a remarkable achievement. This was in, in the 1860s. So the bridge was, um, before that there were two road bridges, they were both washed away. 1857 and 1860, they were both washed away um, because of the floods. Now this bridge was built quite high above the water to be higher than the known flood level. And in 1867, the flood level came right up uh, almost to the deck of the bridge. It washed away some of the approaches of the bridge, in fact, and they were replaced. I'm driving all this. So the road, the, the railway started up the mountains here. Now, we'll see some of the obstacles they had to face here. We'll see the Lapsack Viaduct and, and other features as we walk along. We're standing on a big embankment here, here, so this has all been built up. And we'll see some cuttings and so on. So a lot of civil works that we'll look at. Just where we are here was a location known as Breakfast Point. Uh, there was a small platform built here. Um, there's some different dates on the timing of that, but sometime between that, 1875 and uh, 1880, there was a platform built here um, for the reason of excursion trains coming up here and people alighting and having a look at the view, but also serving some of the local residents around here too, because we already had some settlement. With the coming of the railway, immediately people were buying land, speculating even in, in selling the land, there was a subdivision drawn up here um, and, um, and a, a station which was to serve the subdivision as well. So the platform was probably just here. Um, and um, probably all we want to say here, and we'll move along. And one thing that G-bungs have is a flaky bark that's actually antiseptic. And not only is it antiseptic, but it's also very good for your skin a sample of it um, yeah. um, and as a result of that um, this would be a very old tree um, also it's very hard timber the timber's hard and the bark's hard so they call it iron bark and in the old days these are very preferred for railway sleepers and bridges 
because one of our inbox features out there. Uh, we're actually standing in an area that 250 million years ago was a swamp. It was a wetland and the, you had uh, dragonflies about that long and all the old Jurassic sort of foliage. But we were down there and the Sydney Basin is uh, a vast flat wetland, the whole area, and of peat lakes and bog and bounded by Newcastle in the north, that far up, Ulladulla in the south, Lithgow in the west, and 20 kilometres further out to sea from Sydney. And that's called the Continental Shelf. Newcastle, yeah, to Ulladulla or yeah, so that's Durris. a big area, and the whole area stayed in years. It was, and we call it the Sydney Basin, and it was formed during the Permian period, 290 million years ago, in the Triassic period, 250, 200 million years ago. Now imagine a period of 100 million years, not 10 years, 1,000 years, or uh, 10,000, but 100 million years of static. Nothing much happened. Elsewhere in the world, there are volcanoes and massive mountain ranges being made, but it stayed very, very static in Sydney. Anyway, it's formed by uh, continuous layers of foliage compressing down without oxygen and they fall into coal. Uh, and then on top of that later on you had shale hanging on the top. So things started to move. Uh, but originally Australia 360 million years ago, we were on the equator. We were actually if you can imagine the centre of the equator. And tectonic plate movements, everyone's familiar with that, what that is. We were slowly starting to drift south from the equator, but we're drifting at a rate where our fingernails grow. That's how slow it is. If you didn't cut your fingernail in a year, they'd be up to there somewhere. Well, that's how far every year that Australia was moving. So, to give you an idea how slow and static, um, so the tectonic plates are moving us from, the, from where we were down towards, the, down towards the Antarctic. We were actually moving south. Um, Brisbane finished up by being attacked, uh, a trap attached to the Antarctic. If you can imagine Brisbane, it's currently facing east, it was facing south. So the, the whole country was slowly moving end on. And we moved down and we attached ourselves to the Antarctic. And the sediment from glacial and river erosion further out west and north. Um, now during the Triassic period, 250 million years ago, large rivers, massive rivers, you can't comprehend the amount of water coming in. They, they brought massive amounts of sand and deposited this sand on top of the shale that I was talking about before. And then the basin sank, further sank under that weight. You can imagine the weight of all this. And we're talking about from Newcastle to Aladola, the whole area was affected the same way. Um, compression and heat form these sands into sandstone. The sandstone formed under a lot of pressure. The heat, because it's underneath there with tectonic movement and stresses, heat builds up inside the sandstone. Uh, we've got two types of sandstone on the Blue Mountains. One's called the Narrabeen Group, and that rock can be seen westwards of Woodford. It's got a lot more ironstone in it, and you see a lot of the rocks around Black Heath and Murrays and the garden walls out. Here is called Hawkesbury Sandstone. And it's got abundant cross bedding and what they call interbed there. And there's the sandstone underneath it. So you can see different periods that there was different amount of water flow. The stronger the water flow, the more mobile the pebbles and things become. When the water settles, come in and find the materials of mud to form into shale. So you can see that's what they call interbedding and that all forms part of the whole spring group of rock. Uh, it's unbelievable uh, it's hard, but that can be picked away quite easily. That's very hard, the sandstone. Sedimentation largely finished about 205 million years ago. Now we're talking about the mountains now, they're 
the area slowly started to lift. And we're talking about folding during the Jurassic period, 170 million years ago. Um, since that period, we've had volcanisation at volcanoes, and intrusion. Sun Valley was an open volcanic neck. Uh, Mount Wilson was a volcano. Mount Irvine, you see those large mountains on the horizon when you're coming up this way. They're, they're volcanism, that's what happened to harden to surrounding land and it's slower for them to weather than it is for this to weather. Um, bear in mind, while all this is happening, we're starting to split again from the Antarctic. And it took 60 million years for us to come away from the Antarctic again and slowly move back the way we were before to where we are now, with Brisbane facing the east again. So we're back to where we started from at one stage. 60 million years from splitting from the Antarctic to come here. Um, Pretty extraordinary. The Blue Mountains are not actually a mountain range. They call them Blue Mountains. They're not a mountain range. It's an it's an it's an uplift with warping, and it forms an escarpment like a tableland, and it's sloping from where we are now all the way up to Black Heath, from the top of the Blue Mountains. Um, now it's got eroded, but to give you an idea how slowly this is coming up. The rivers are able to slowly erode down all the time and produce the valleys and the cliffs and the, the gullies that we see today. Um, and these features are what made it so difficult for Cox to build his road and Whitman the railway and the explorers to get over here. Now the Lapson monocline, this is where we're standing now. Remember we were, when I mentioned it was before, the Lapson monocline came after the Blue Mountains, late in the Blue Mountains development. Uh, it's, it was a fault line, but the Lepian River, as we call it now, actually flowed through here. And we've got some of this material came from the Lachlan Fold Belt out west. It's quartzite, and it's very, very hard, and it's flowed this river gravel all the way from the Lachlan Fold Belt, all the way from parks and ponds and all out west. It was originally dragged out by glaciers when we were down near the Antarctic. And massive water is pushing this through. If anyone being threatened in Yarramundi, where the road crosses the mm. river there, mm. you see all those lucky stones and gravel. That's called Rickaby's Creek gravel, geologically. And that was in parts up here too. And it's also under the Jones Sutherland Centre in Penrith. It made it very difficult for them to build on these beds. Very, very hard stones they couldn't drill through. So it's been in different places. But of course we're too high for it now, so... And that's basically um, where we've come from with the Blue Mountains. Actually, yeah, what we're saying about the, uh, the river and the river stones, um, the elapsed the monocline has pushed the New Peen River into different courses, so where the New Peen River used to be, you know, has now been pushed up onto the top of a hill. And that basically the same thing happens at Lapstone. The reason Lapstone's got its name Lapstone is because of the stones, <laughs> um, Lapstones, which is an old cobbler's thing. Hmm. Uh, cobblers used to use these things on their laps to make shoes, so basically Lapson's full of the range, as big as yeah. the Himalayas. And the river system was like the Ganges Delta, which dumped all these sediments here. Um, it's long gone, it's disappeared, it's washed away, but um, that was in the landscape about 200 million years ago. Hmm. We're talking about massive amounts of water to comprehend too, is in time. I talk about 250 million years ago. I mean, you're talking about uh, you know, 2,000 years ago when the Romans were around and so on, and, and but we're talking about all oh, 250 million years mm -hmm. and the time it's taken, but it's very slow, interceptively slow. The mountains of that this tableland was lifting, and it gave the rivers time to cut their way through. And the gorge up there, at, uh, when you're coming on the railway and you look down into that big gorge, the river cut its way down into there. But the point is, if it had happened quickly, like a whole earthquake moved it all up, we would have had an inland lake because the river wouldn't have been able to catch up with the, and erode as fast as, mm. as the land is coming up. So it gives you an idea how slow everything is. Mm. And this master plan is looking at the um, um, ways that the whole, all the government owned lands on the escarpment can be managed. So we're talking about from, um, we're talking about land 
from about Yarramundi down to Glenbrook Gorge. And this includes council managed land, crown land, national parks land and water land, uh, railway land and that type of thing. Um, but it's, it's actually, it's like a vision document. And um, um, look, this landscape, there's so much potential with this landscape and unfortunately um, a lot needs to be spent on it to make this potential come to life. Um, it's got a lot of historical and heritage stuff. Uh, and with that historic and heritage stuff, there's a massive, la um, a, a great potential for, for, um, yeah, for, for recreation. This, this uh, master plan has visions about recreation and linking places up with tracks and things. I'll just see if I can find another inspirational picture about recreation. Um, things like bikes, which is a big thing on the escarpment here. Um, another far part of the management of the Eastern Escarpment is also Aboriginal management. was built through here. They divert the water coming down the hill um, to go down and uh, into the gully here rather than allowing the water to come down onto the railway line. And uh, there's also a culvert that goes underneath here. We'll see one of these culverts further up. Um, they're all part of the um, construction of the railway line. Um, so we'll move along. Totally horizontal. It's just the pressure of the land has been pushing it up. Mm. You can see how those horizontal layers are actually sloping up. Mm. And then all different levels, and then there's some shale up the top. So you can see that the shale yeah. is fairly horizontal. But in the meantime, you've had these layers going up and then other layers coming in on top of them. So it's taken a long time for this to build up. There's a sort of almost a remnant of what's left of the shales. They're slowly weathering off the sandstone, but they weren't all on top of the sandstone before. There's just a little bit left up there. You can see that fine material. It's the, it's the, um, it was the direct word to South Creek. So South Creek was known as Wayana Meadow. We're running it into the creek. Look at the price of petrol today. When they were spilling the shale, they were actually running the, uh, into the Wolga River. They were running the, they didn't want to use, which they used for lamps, but also for battleships. Because we're talking about the 1914 and 12 and things like that. They, they needed to move it over to Sydney for use in ships as bunker fuel. So um, that's, that's new to the other side of the um, West of the Ranges a lot. We've got a Port Jackson fig there, um, and they just plants a cheese tree. It's not really cheese, but the fruit looks like cheese. But don't eat it, it's slightly poisonous, so don't eat it. The weed we have now called trad, or wandering Jew, it's very closely related. It's called scurvy weed. Yes, yes. So it's uh, vitamin, C, vitamin C, is it? High in vitamin, anything green's full of vitamin C. Navvies, and they were known as navvies because in England, when they were building canals, navigable canals, they, they were the men that dug the canals, and later on they went into building railways when the railway captain came in, and the canals went out of favour. But the navvies were, uh, they excavated numerous canal systems in the 18th and 19th century in England, um, but they came out here because there was a shortage of labour especially in the gold rush in Victoria, and people didn't want to work. They wanted to go out and try and make their fortune in the gold fields. So the government brought 500 navvies from England. They were recruited from England. They came out here to work on the Sydney Railway Company. Uh, and that was at the time when it only ran, it didn't even get the Parramatta the railway at that stage, so they had to build it. Um, they came out on three ships in August and September, 1853, these 500 men arrived. They completed the Sydney to Parramatta line, 22 kilometres, on the 18th of August, 1855, and the trains are now running to Parramatta. Uh, in Britain, the navvies were paid in vouchers, with very, very tough conditions, with very, very mean employers. So they paid them with vouchers, and they had to use their vouchers in what they call the Tommy shop. And the Tommy shop was a shop run by the contractor. So they were virtually giving them the money, inflating the price of everything mm -hmm. they bought. And they had to buy everything because they were in isolated sites. So mm -hmm. they, Tommy shop set up in caravans or wooden sheds. 
and they had to buy their own blankets and buy their own food and, and alcohol was even sold. But uh, so they were, we had a large contract there here that got a successful contract they came out from Britain called Peter Brassie and Betts. And they successfully tendered the railway construction in New South Wales. Uh, they had a good reputation with the natives and they paid them in cash. So it was a lot better deal. I don't think Whitten would have tolerated uh, what went on in England with the their own type of slang language they used. It was very similar to Cockney slang and names like frog and toad, that meant road. Uh, sugar and honey meant money. Jimmy Skinner meant dinner. Uh, Billy Gorman meant foreman. And all these, they, that was just the way they, but they were, it was basically said so that their, their superiors or foremans couldn't understand what they were saying. So they confused them and they developed their own language to confuse their superiors. Mm -hmm. no, so, um, uh, also name change was a problem. Many of them are workers that were probably escaping from the law or had other issues in society, so they came out here to work on these jobs. Uh, and often they changed their name because they had a running with their previous contractor, who in many cases the same contractor building these works. <laughs> so they, they were, they were um, pretty headstrong sort of fellas. Uh, some had families and they travelled with them from job to job. Uh, shanty towns were established around the construction site and they consisted of tents strung up on saplings and it give you an idea but there was a base fire which they cooked food on normally food like Irish stews and things like that. They still had, the food was pretty awful, but it still had that new, new, nutrient in it because they were working hard. If they didn't have proper food, well, they, they, they uh, supplies were brought in by contractors to here, the supplies were bought for the men, and the food was brought in, in site, to the site in caravans, horse-drawn caravans. Generally, it was poor quality, and if they could not work because of injury or infection or something like that, they didn't earn any money. So it was tough, but they were still allocated meal tickets so they could still eat uh, until they got better. Uh, disease was often a problem in these sort of camps. Typhus, cholera and dysentery could devastate the workforce from time to time. Um, navvies were divided into groups, controlled by gangs, and the gang are in charge of them. The Navvy's day was very long, hard and dangerous. The Navvy's went six days a week. Sunday was supposed to be the day to go to church. The minister would come out and operate those services, but most of them preferred to drink. And so they, they got sort of fairly well under the weather on a Sunday. They had to recover by Monday. Uh, a good Navvy could move under up to 20 tonnes of material a day. We're talking about 20 tonnes of this material taken out. Uh, many started out but couldn't achieve that until they built up their resilience and they could work a bit more and get it up. But they were paid for what they knew. Uh, a lady here was mentioning before about a pick and a shovel. Well, they built this whole railway by using a pick, shovel, drill, sledgehammers and a barrel and drains. And that's all they had, just all by hand. No machinery, no steam shovels, nothing. Um, now, I'd just like to quickly they were drilled by um, three men. They were, they'd have, one man would have a large drill, but that left down, and two other men would have sledgehammers. So one man would come down and belt the top of it, he'd turn it a quarter of a turn, and then the other man would belt it. He'd turn it another quarter, and they'd hit it. So the three men per drill, working in areas, and come back in, and that's how they drilled the hole. They came down in, anywhere up to about a metre, and then they put gunpowder in, packed it up with clay, put a wick in, got out of the way and then lift the fuse and it blew out the side of the sandstone. When they started at the top, they'd go down a metre, so you can see each, some of these drills don't go right, they sort of stagger, you can see where that went when they came across here. So it would have been blown out to that level and then they came down another level and blew that out. And all the rock material was taken up on drays and sometimes barrows taken up and dumped into those valleys to make the cutting, to make the, the, uh, the top of the railway run through. So it's cut here and fill up there. So all that's hand work. 
different teams that do different things. Uh, I've got an impression just on this page here. Um, and um, Port Jackson Fig. The ballast used on the track was sandstone. Okay, here's another feature. Structure and some... Yeah. Yeah. There's not a lot of fighting. Mine ...and a few of the workers there. Yeah. Um, also... You can do it also from here. A photo, maybe of the... You can see they're nicely made sandstone blocks. Mm -hmm. What is a zigzag and why is a zigzag? Well, uh, it goes back to when the, the original line was surveyed. How, the, how were they going to get up this ridge? Now, we said the ridge is a monocline. It's a long uh, feature. One way to get up would be to move along the, that monocline, gradually climbing. And we saw that the road just went straight up. Uh, not no good for a railway. Um, steel wheels on um, iron rails tend to be a bit slippery, so you need a gradual incline. So, like we see here, this is not level; it's actually a, an incline that we're on here. And now, the problem with coming up this monocline just at this point was uh, okay until you got to Nap the Knapsack Gully. He had to went and had to build a, a huge viaduct to get across that, but then he had to try and get the railway line up high enough. Um, by the next gully, because there are gullies all the way along this monocline. Um, that gully is Tunnel Gully. Now what Whitten wanted, what wanted to do was to take the railway line up to Tunnel Gully, curving in and then through a tunnel and, and then into uh, Glenbrook that way. He wasn't allowed to because of money, because um, of uh, difficulties in building tunnels in those days. Um, so it came down to a costing, it came down to a compromise. The zigzag that we see here and that we're walking along was that compromise because his railway would have been uh, further down on the, what we call the bottom road. It would have gone up Tunnel Gully through the tunnel. But now what happens is, or well, what happened then to, to get it up um, here, it forms a zigzag, which is a, means that the railway came up into Tunnel Gully. The trains then had to reverse. They reversed up um, what's called the middle road. We can just see it down here. You can see a bit of track down here and um, coming up to another set of points at the top here which you'll see shortly and this is the train coming up that middle road from the bottom road reversing up the hill uh, this wasn't normal the way normally the way that you ran a railway you don't go in reverse of course but that was the uh, solution to getting up the hill uh, and then uh, coming forwards up this way into Glenbrook so coming around and over the top of the hill rather than through a tunnel now eventually the tunnel was built and that was the 1890s. 1892 it was opened and that was Whitten's original vision but it was after his time. He'd already retired by then. So, uh, But this was the interim solution and as I said it was a compromise for the time. Zigzags are very unusual throughout the world. There are a few um, but this one was unusual too in being on a main line so trains having to reverse and run backwards. Yeah, so that's, a, that's a fault, yeah definitely. Is that a stress factor? Fault line. And this is iron in there, but very hard, very brittle and hard, like iron it is. And it's in solution, the iron, and it comes through the joints in the stone. So, uh, the stress levels go across all that, mm -hmm. open it up. Mm -hmm. and that's How it. is the iron going to solution? It's very mm -hmm. hot. No, it's in, in liquid. It's dissolved. No. Okay, we're at a place called the Top Points. So this is the... ...to a possum. There's one particular possum that's coming here very regularly and getting stuff into this tree, getting into grey gums. This tree must have something special about it. It must have tasty leaves or tasty sap or something. There's something about it that this possum likes getting into. In the zigzag, I mentioned the planes coming up from the pain, run forward, up towards Tunnel Gully, then reversing up this 
um, for these form the zigzag. So there was a set of points here to uh, a junction to control the train. Um, there would have been a pointsman who, uh, we'll see where his cottage was. Um, uh, down here, he, he lived here. Uh, he operated the points here and, and down at the bottom points. So he'd um, be there before the train to operate and to signal the train through and let it pass. But this is a very slow, this is bottom point. So top points is something similar to that. Uh, this was a very slow way of working trains and that's why the zigzag didn't last too long. And that's why the tunnel was built. Um, very slow, and the, the, um, the number of trains and also the length of your trains. About what, 1 in 30, is that right? 1 in 30. Yeah, 1 in 33 here, the bottom road is 1 in 30. The, the current railway line is 1 in 60, so what oh. that means is it has to take twice the distance to get half the grade, but it, you can carry twice the load. Mm -hmm. It follows a very narrow ridge line. Mm -hmm. The only way to make the grade easier would be to make it more windy. Mm -hmm. And then that slows the trains as well because it's just Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. On the other side, so how did they do it with another zigzag? So that's the Lithgow zigzag, or called the Great Zigzag. It was a larger undertaking even than what was done here, uh, and uh, that's well worth a visit in itself. So that's why we're here. Lucasville, um, named after a politician called John Lucas, he had his house above here. And being a politician, he could just say to his mates, I'd like a platform built. Thank you. And so they built a platform for him called Lucasville, of course, as you do. There were a number of um, platforms on the on the Blue Mountains line that were built specifically for politicians. So it's nice to be a politician. Now there was a waiting shed just here um, as well. And steps, as you see, Lucas's house was somewhere up there. There's no trace of it today. Um, it's somewhere underneath the buildings on the RAAF base up there. So the RAAF base, you can actually, I can see the buildings up there from here, on the top of them. So it's not far up. Now there were a couple of houses along the ridge at that time. John Lucas built, bought up um, two lots, a 45 acre lot here and a 10 acre lot on the other side of Knapsack Street. He built um, three houses, only a small modest cottages. Um, this is one of them. This is the one that he occupied, that we know of, but he probably occupied the others as they were built. This seems to be the last one that he built. This is built of, of brick. The other two were built of stone. Um, Logie is one of the other houses, but it was probably a much more modest house when originally built by Lucas. We see it there um, as a reasonably grand house overlooking the, the plains. Uh, that house now is incorporated into the Lapston Hill Hotel, which is now the RAAF base. Um, so parts of it still exist, but not very recognisable. Um, which the buildings are still there and quite grand. It's an Art Deco building, so that's just up here. But the railway was long gone by the time that was built. How was it built? A different railway line than what we have today. Um, today we have the flat bottom rail, which just sits flat on the, on the sleeper. In those days they had what was called shared rail, or ball head rail, or double head rail. Um, you can see the photo. Um, it sits in a cast iron chair and has a, a symmetrical shape to it. The advantage of that was you could flip it over and use the other side. So when one side got worn, you could flip it over. Why? Because it was filled of iron. it was made of iron. Iron wears very quickly, so it was useful to be able to flip it over and use the other side. It was held into the chair by a, um, a wooden wedge. 
that somebody would have to come along and tap the wedges just to make sure the line was secure. Collision here, the train um, colliding into the buffer, a number of people injured, and they rebuilt the line to be higher up, which gave more gradient uh, to slow the train down. Oh, so this is the gradient when there's... Um, how long? I think somebody's marked this. A yellow bloodwood. We've got yellow bloodwoods and red bloodwoods around Sydney. They're called bloodwoods because they pump out heaps of sap which looks like blood. Now this sap, um, it's actually high in something called keno, a chemical called keno. Um, do you know when you have cups of tea, black tea? Yeah, black tea is full of tannin. And tannin actually is the things that plants produce to, to bind proteins. It's a way that plants protect themselves from insects. Tannins usually bind insects like little caterpillars' mouths together and stop them from eating too much. Um, tannins bind our proteins together too. They're used in tanning, um, hence they use yeah, tanning. Um, so they use wattle bark for tanning. Um, if you've got a sick stomach, you can have black tea and the tannins help bind the stomach together. Um, Kino is a bit like tannin, but it's like a super version of tannin. So Kino is really, really strong. It's very similar to tannin, but super strong. I wouldn't eat, I wouldn't eat pure Kino or pure sap, but um, in the old days, they used to mix this with water. When people had dysentery or diarrhea, they would go to bloodwood trees or similar type of eucalypts, get the sap, mix it with water, and it would put a lining on people's stomach. So it would settle them down if they had dysentery or diarrhea. Pointsman's Cottage, he lived there. He operated the points at the top points and at the bottom points, so he'd walk up. This, this, well, this is the old Pointsman's Cottage where the Pointsman lived. And actually, yes, you know, it was smart to take that stone out of there and try and cut it. And some's better for building and cutting than others. Did you talk about that? Talk to the group. Oh, that's all I've really got to say. Oh. That I know of, all, all strong through here. But they, they, they did it as close as they could to the work. Mm. So you can see. She got sandstone. Yeah. yeah. So this stuff, activity yeah. fault sort of stuff. Mm. Yeah. And they're opportunistic quarries that are dotted through the landscape. Why? Never yeah. would have still been here and mm. take a load of um, mm. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Mm. And Kieran was saying the Pointsman's Cottage was a great place to go and rip off building material. Show the photo we saw before of the train coming down the hill. So, yeah. bottom points we can't really see. It's somewhere where the highway is down here, um, further down. Um, but we're standing somewhere near where this um, was taken. Um, this, um, this is the artist's imagination, so we don't really know exactly how factual it is. It doesn't, for example, seem to show the quarry. Um,